Okay. Good morning, good morning. Welcome and welcome to those joining us online this morning. Uh, we are in the book of Romans, chapter 2. If you would turn with us there, Romans, chapter 2. And just again, as a kind of a setting for where we are as we work our way through chapter 2, we looked at last week, the day that is coming, when every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord. And we, we talked about that last week, you know, this day of judgment that is coming. And uh, you and I, as born-again believers, that is a day that, that we don't have to face. We don't face that judgment because Jesus took it upon himself on our behalf. But that day is coming, and we're talking, we were talking about that last week as kind of a, a lead in to this. And as I mentioned uh, the previous weeks as we've worked our way through chapter 2, many commentators, many biblical scholars believe that the, the address going all the way back into verse 1 of chapter 2 when he says, therefore you have no excuse, that he was speaking primarily to the self-righteous Jew, um, the one that felt that he was, he was in a right place just because he was Jewish and, you know, the whole thing. And many believe that because of where we're going to kind of start going through today and continuing into next week as we move into chapter 3, Lord willing, but follow along with me now as we begin in verse 17. He says, But if you bear the name Jew and rely upon the law and boast in God and know his will and approve the things that are essential being instructed out of the law and are confident that you yourselves are a guide to the blind, a light to those who are in darkness, a corrector of the foolish, a teacher of the immature, Having in the law the embodiment of knowledge and of the truth, you therefore who teach another, do you teach yourself? You who preach that one shall not steal, do you steal? You who say that one should not commit adultery, do you commit adultery? You who abhor idols, do you rob temples? You who boast in the law through your breaking of the law, do you dishonor God? For the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you, just as it is written. Paul, again, starts to zero in on this particular thing, and again, highlighting the fact that, that the, the Jewish people were God's chosen people. They had a unique relationship with Creator God, Far different than any all of other of mankind, the Jewish people, God's chosen people. This relationship that they had, the Jewish people, with God. The honor, the privilege that he's highlighting with this. The, the benefits that are a part of that. Boasting in God. Not boasting in themselves, they're not supposed to be anyway. That's kind of where, where all of this comes off the rails, but boasting in God. God chose them, as it tells us in Deuteronomy chapter 7, not because they were anything special. God highlights that even saying, it's not because you were like some great group of people. As a matter of fact, when God chose the Jewish people, he chose them when they were one man, Abraham. Not because they were a multitude, some vast army, but, but one and he highlights the fact that the law was given to them. It was given to them to know God's will, the creator of the universe, them specifically, the Jewish people, to know God's will. Instructions were given to them, entrusted to them, and they were to be ambassadors out into the world, a light out into the world. However, it led to a a false sense of security, if you would, with the Jewish people. You see, information, even designation alone, doesn't equate to justification. It wasn't just because the information had been given to them. It wasn't because they were designated as God's chosen people that all of a sudden they're okay. They were to guard the truth. They were to protect it. They were to teach it. But, you know, if you do all of those things and you don't live it out, there's a word for that hypocrite. And it's a word that's used often in the New Testament. Jesus used the word over and over to speak to those that put those rules out there and walked in, the, uh, in this arrogance 
and above everyone else because of this relationship that they had with God, because the law was given to them, because they knew the letter of the law, and they did certain things, but they weren't walking in that, and they didn't have the heart with that. It was basically that whole idea of religion without reality. Even a relationship with God without reality. There was nothing backing that up. And notice the strong words that are used here in verse 24. The name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you. Because of you. Wow. Strong, strong words. Preaching to others how to live, but not living that way themselves. Stealing. (laughs) Don't steal. It's one one of the commandments. Do not steal. But aren't you stealing? And we talked about that in one of the home studies in the, over the last couple of weeks. What does that look like? I mean, what, what, what is, what is that, how has that played out? How were they stealing? Well, to the very people that they were supposed to be the light to, they were supposed to be the example to the Gentiles. In the court of the Gentiles, outside of the temple, they had all of these booths set up and stands set up where they were ripping the Gentiles off. Gentiles were coming. They were, they were trying to get to know this God. And when they got there, they were saying, well, you're going to have to sacrifice, and the the sacrifice you brought, brought isn't good enough, so you need to exchange that for this and make it huge money. And that's those when Jesus showed up, that's the tables of the money changers that he was overturning. That's why. Because of this very thing, God's name was blasphemed among the Gentiles because of that very thing, stealing from from others, profiting off of their, their relationship with God. And we looked at that over the last couple of weeks, the things that Paul has highlight, is highlighting in that, not only in the Jewish people, but in, in us, these attitudes we need to be careful of, impressing man instead of God. This, this idea that, hey, man, if I'm good with, if I, I can impress you, and man, look how holy I am, and all that sort of stuff, and ignoring God. Jesus on the Sermon on the Mount said, I hope you enjoy that, that fame, that, that, that relationship there, because you are getting nothing from the Father. Well, he goes on in verse 25. The name of God blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you, those those things that he was talking about, breaking the law. But notice now, he says, for indeed circumcision is of value if you practice the law. But if you are a transgressor of the law, your circumcision has become uncircumcision. So if the uncircumcised man keeps the requirements of the law, Will not his uncircumcision be regarded as circumcision? And he who is physically uncircumcised, if he keeps the law, will he not judge you who have through the letter of the law and circumcision are a transgressor of the law? For he is not a Jew who is one outwardly, nor is circumcision that which is outward in the flesh. But he is a Jew who is one inwardly. And circumcision is that which is of the heart, by the spirit, not by the letter. And his praise is not from men, but from God. Again, circumcision, this covenant that was given to the Jewish people, again, to Abraham, this this, uh, covenant that was made with them and this ritual that was to point to that covenant that was made. But again, Paul is highlighting here, just as religion without reality is worthless, so is ritual without reality. Focusing on the physical practice and totally missing the spiritual significance of circumcision and what it was point, pointing to. An outward action without an inward change is meaningless. Any type of ritual, anything along those lines. Jeremiah 9, 25 and 26, the prophet writes, Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, that I will punish all who are circumcised and yet uncircumcised. Now again, just as we're reading through this part, circumcised and yet uncircumcised. When you think about that, you're kind of thinking, well, how is that possible? That's kind of like being pregnant and not pregnant at the same time, right? I mean, that's just, right? No. Again, the physical totally missing the spiritual is what God is speaking of. He says, Egypt and Judah and Edom and the sons of Ammon and Moab and all those inhabiting the desert who clip the hair on their temples, for all the nations are uncircumcised 
and all the house of Israel are uncircumcised of heart. Don't miss what he's saying there. He's saying the Jewish people, my chosen people, are no different than the rest of the world if their heart is no different. Even though you're outwardly circumcised, you're uncircumcised in heart, so you're falling into the same category as all of, the, all of Egypt, Judah, Edom, sons of Ammon, Moab, all of those who are uncircumcised physically. If your heart is not right, if your heart is not there, Again, Paul highlighting the idea that religion and relationship and ritual are not enough unless it's made a change, unless there's reality behind that. And that's what what Paul is highlighting here. And again, it kind of underscores what we've talked about the last couple of weeks. So if you will allow me, if you'll bear with me (laughs) as we kind of go back to now verse 17, and I want to look at this in a little different light, I wanna change a couple of words. And I know that sounds heretical to us Calvary Chapel people, right? (laughs) Where we're verse by verse, word by word, right? But I wanna change just a couple of words and I think you'll understand why. Let me read starting in verse 17 again. But if you bear the name Christian and rely upon the word of God, and boast in God, and know his will, and approve the things that are essential, being instructed out of the word of God. You see, you and I as Christians, there's some very real benefits and privileges that are yours and mine as Christians, uniquely because we are Christians. Just as the Jews, as as Paul was highlighting here, uniquely for them, as Jews, as the chosen people, you and I as Christians also have privileges and benefits. What a benefit, what what a sweet thing it is to bear the name Christian. Paul John writes in 1 John chapter 3: see how great a love the Father has bestowed on us that we would be called children of God. And such we are. Not we will be, we are. For this reason, the world does not know us because it does not know him. It does not know the Lord Jesus. Behold, now we are children of God and it has not yet appeared as yet what we will be. We know that when he appears, when Christ appears, we will be like him because we will see him just as he is. And everyone who has this hope fixed on him, us as Christians, having this hope fixed on him, purifies himself just as he is pure. We are saved, born again as Christians, and we are born again into the family of God. What an awesome privilege that is. To consider that, you and I, children of God, and as John says, and such we are. Do you know that? Do you know that as a Christian? Do you live that? Do you own that reality that you are a child of the living God? And with that, there are benefits. (laughs) There are privileges that are yours and mine, uniquely ours, because we are Christians. And again, going back to the text, notice right away there that we rely on the word of God. We lean on the word of God. This that we hold in our hands, the very word of God. We set our hope in this. We lean on this. We rely on this. And it tells us, the the word of God even tells us that this has been preserved for you and I for our instruction. (laughs) That we're supposed to study it, that we're supposed to learn from it, even as I believe we should be doing right now as as we're going through this. This, verses 17 through 29, was not recorded for the Jewish benefit only. It was recorded for you and I. For our instruction. Not for us to shake our heads at them and say, oh, how could they? No, for us to look at so that we can avoid the same things that they fell into, the privileges and the benefits that they had. And we have that to rely on the word of God 
We go through this often and we highlight this over and over and over, but it, it bears repeating again. Guys, everything that we need is in here. Everything. It's complete. There's not missing chapters. There is not necessary books that we need to read outside of this in order to gain further insight or anything else. No, it's all here. It's all here. Everything. We need everything that's in here and everything that we need is in here. It's alive. It's active. We talk of this often and, you know, when we're just talking about the Word of God. Isn't it so awesome that pretty, every time, pretty much, when you go into the Word of God, you could be reading something you have read a hundred times before, yet it's fresh and it's new and something else God reveals to you in something that you could probably quote from memory, but you're reading it in your daily devotion and something else jumps off the page at you. That's because it's, this is a living thing, the living Word of God. And it's enduring it doesn't change. Praise God. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever, and his word endures forever. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, all scripture, all scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, so that the man of God, the woman of God, may be fully equipped, may be adequate, equipped for every good work. And not only that, again, same thing as we just keep moving through the list here. We bear the name Christian, we rely on the word of God, and we boast in God. We can, again, as Christians, bear that same thing. We can boast in God, not boast in ourselves. The world boasts in its wisdom, right? The world boasts in all of the, the letters that are behind their names and all of the wisdom that they, they accumulate and all of this kind of stuff. And we were talking before, uh, before the service. Isn't it amazing how how the world just thinks they're so smart. And people just, the, the way that they're talking and the way that they have it all, and they, they have their own versions of the truth, and yet we as Christians, we look at the world around us and we're going, these people are all nuts. <laughs> this is all craziness. This isn't truth. This is all deception, and we see it so clearly. Why? Because God has given us vision to see. He's given us clarity and understanding in his word. And it's not something that we boast in. We, can, we say, all glory to God. Praise the Lord that he allows us to see those things. The world chasing after all of the fame and riches and all of the things that the world claims to offer but can never deliver. Jeremiah 9 again. Thus says the Lord, let not a wise man boast of his wisdom, let not the mighty man boast of his might, let not the rich man boast of his riches, but let him who boasts boast of this. If you're going to brag about something, brag on this, that he knows and understands me. That I am the Lord who exercises loving kindness, justice, and righteousness on earth, for I delight in these things, declares the Lord. He delights in doing those things, loving kindness, exercising that, and justice and righteousness, but he delights also when we see that, recognize that, and give glory to him. Paul writes in Philippians chapter 3 that he counts everything as a loss in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus, his Lord. Everything else that the world chases after, he says, that's just loss to me. That's nothing to me compared to knowing Christ Jesus. In verse 18, again, as Christians, we have the unique ability, notice, to know his will, to know God's will. And when we, when we think of God's will, it's important that we understand that there are different facets to God's will. First of all, God's sovereign will, his prevailing will. God is absolutely, totally, completely sovereign. And again, as we just spoke of after worship this morning, that is a great and awesome thing when we look around the world, right? To know that God is in absolute control. Nothing can stand in his way. Nothing can change the course of his will and his design. Ephesians 1.11 tells us that he works all things after the counsel of his will. Almighty, all-powerful creator God. He is sovereign. But he also has a permissive will. In his sovereignty, and again, we're not going to, I'm not even going to try to begin to explain how this works. It just does work. In his sovereignty, he gives us permission. 
He allows us to make choices. Galatians 6 verse 7 says that we reap what we sow. So you and I choose what it is that we're sowing, but we don't, get to, we don't get to choose the consequences of that, but he allows us to make choices. Deuteronomy 30, verses 19 and 20, God says, I call heaven and earth to witness against you today that I have set before you life and death, the blessing and the curse. So choose life, he says, in order that you may live, you and your descendants, by loving the Lord your God and by obeying his voice and by holding fast to him. God says, I'm giving you, I'm laying it before you. Life and death, you choose. Make, you make that choice. Joshua 24, 15, choose today whom you will serve. Choice. We have that choice. In God's sovereignty, he gives us the ability to make choices. But in, uh, in all of that, God also has a very specific personal will for each and every one of us. And that's such, an, that's such an awesome thing to think about. Again, almighty, all-powerful creator God, knowing everything that is going on and ha his hand involved in everything and his will has a very specific and personal will for you, for me. And right down to the very details, some of the things that, you know, like again, well, I, I wonder what, what God's will is for this and God's will is for that. He wants us to know what his will is for us. The Bible tells us there are certain things that are very, very clear about his will for us. First of all, his will is that everyone is saved. The Bible tells us very specifically, your salvation, that's his will for you. If you have not, if you have not received Jesus as Lord of your life, his will is for you to surrender and submit your life to him and receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior. His will also, it tells us in his word, is that we are filled with his spirit. His, word for e his will for each one of us is that we are sanctified, that we are set apart, that our life is to follow after him and the things that he has for us. But it goes right down to the very specifics, moment by moment. We were talking about that yesterday at the men's, the men's Bible study. You know, that, does God really care about the really little itty bitty things in your life? Yes, yes, he does. Include them in him. Talk to him about it. Pray about it. I was talking about yesterday, so a few years ago, in a, a message that I had given, I was kind of talking along these same lines and just kind of going off my notes, which sometimes can be dangerous. I started <laughs> going off and I started thinking, does God care what I wear to work in the morning? Yes, he does. And somebody challenged me on that afterwards. And I said, well, hang on a second. If you were gonna walk out and you looked ridiculous, or if you had a big stain on your shirt or something like that and your wife saw that, would she say anything? Yeah. My wife says that all the time. Sweetheart, you can't go out like that. <laughs> I got to iron that. I got to change that, whatever. Because she cares how I look. You think God cares any less? Now, you might say, well, that's taking it a little too far. Okay, we can, we can disagree or disagree on that. But God cares about the things in your life. The little things, the little details that you might think, God, I don't want to waste God's time on that. He's like, hey, talk to me about that. I just want to be involved. And we can know that. We can know the things. And again, if the, the, those big decisions, those things that we're going through in our lives, he wants to be involved in that, and he wants us to know his will. And again, going back to his will for us is that we are filled with his Holy Spirit. And when we are, and when we go to him, and when we trust in him, and when we wait on him, the Holy Spirit says, this is the way. Walk in it. And if, and if you're uncertain about something, you wait and you pray until you get that guiding and that leading. And again, guys, this is unique to us as born-again believers. What a privilege to know his will, verse 18, and approve the things that are essential, the things that are excellent, that are things that are best. Again, does that mean that when I'm going to that example with your clothes, if you go out dressed in a way that God, are you sinning? No, no, that's not what I'm saying. <laughs> there's, there's good, and there's better, and there's best. And the Lord wants what's best for us. And this is what this is saying, that we can approve the things, we can know the things that are best. Not only knowing the what of his will, but 
to, to be equipped to, to know how to do it. Ephesians chapter 1, and I'll, I'll just turn there real quickly. I love the, these verses in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 18 and 19. It says, I pray, this is Paul's prayer for the church in Ephesus, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened, that your eyes would be open, that you'd see this, so that you will know what is the hope of his calling, what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints, and what is the surpassing greatness of his power toward us who believe, in accordance with the working of the strength of his might, which he brought about in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at the right hand in heavenly places. How does this all work out? How does his will work out in our lives? The same power that raised Jesus from the dead. That's how the impossible things are possible. As we walk out our faith, we come across those things all the time, don't we? Where we're like, this is impossible. This can't happen. There's no way I could do that. And then as we walk in faith and we move forward in faith, relying on the power of God, wow. <laughs> Proving the things that are essential. Being, being instructed out of the, the word of God. Again, where do we find this? <laughs> where do we know how to walk out those things in our life? Right here, right in his word. Psalm 119, your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Are we allowing God's word, this complete, this living thing to guide and direct our steps in our life? In Psalm 1, it says that if we do, we're blessed. If we delight ourselves in his word, if we meditate on that, if we allow his word to settle into our hearts to the point where it affects the decisions that we make day to day, moment by moment. He likens it, the psalmist in Psalm 1, to, to being like a tree firmly planted by streams of water, getting everything that we need, the nutrients, the water that we need directly from his word. And he says that it will that we'll yield our fruit, that our leaf will not wither. <laughs> I think of that when I was, again, reading this morning in Psalm 1, just reading through it again for this morning. By streams of water, his leaf will not wither. It won't dry out. Are you feeling a little dry? Are you feeling a little withered? Get into the Word. Get into the Word of God. Meditate on that. It says, whatever he does, he prospers. Again, benefits that are ours, privileges that are ours, unique to being Christians. But guys, we can't just stay there. Verse 19 and 20. And are confident that you yourselves are a guide to the blind, a light to those who are in darkness, a corrector of the foolish, a teacher of the immature, having in the, in the word of God the embodiment of knowledge and of the truth. With these incredible benefits and privileges, guys, comes responsibility. We need to be responsible with what it is that we have been given. A guide to the blind. What is he meaning there? A light to those in darkness. Guys, we've, we're called to be salt and light in the world that is around us. A corrector of the foolish. Again, going back to chapter 1. Speaking of the world around us, those that are in the world around us, professing to be wise, they became fools. The world around us, lost, hopeless, thinking they got it all figured out, but desperate. And our call, what we are to be is salt and light, a guide to the blind, a light in the darkness. That's a responsibility that we have. If we're not shining in the, in the world around us, guys, we're failing in that responsibility. A corrector of the foolish, a teacher of the immature. I look at that as that, that element in our Christian walk of, of somebody that's, that's new to the faith and coming alongside them and discipling them. They're, they're immature, they're young in their faith, bringing them along. In the word, the living word, the embodiment of knowledge and the truth. Can't help but think when I'm reading that, the embodiment of knowledge and the truth manifest 
John 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, Christ Jesus, the living Word of God. Hebrews 1, 1 and 2, God, after he spoke long ago to the fathers and the prophets in many portions and in many ways, in these last days has spoken to us in his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom he also made the world. Christ in us, the hope of glory, the living Word of God abiding in us. And then as we go out then into the world and we shine his light, we are not light manufacturers, we are light reflectors, his light. As we go out and we just allow him to to live and to love through us. A responsibility to do that. But guys, also again with that, there's accountability. And that's what's addressed there in those following verses after that, verses 21 through 24. Again, highlighting that there's accountability, not just, to, not just to have the knowledge, not just to speak the knowledge, not just to be out there talking to others and even talking down to others, but we need to be living that out if, so that we are not falling into that, that hypocritical place ourselves. This relationship, the, 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 the religion without reality. So many times I hear this, and perhaps you've heard it, perhaps you've said it, I know I've even said it, that, that Christianity is not about, it's, it's not about religion, it's about relationship. Well, that's true, but it's not just any relationship. It's not just about having a relationship with Jesus. Can I, can I let you in on something? Satan has a relationship with Jesus, and it's not a good one. It's not the one that you and I want to have. <laughs> it's, it's, it's not just any relationship. No, it is a sold out, living all for him relationship. It's, he is not just my savior, he is my Lord. And I do what he says and I follow after him. Christ in me, I am allowing him to live out through me. And when I am not doing that, if I am just talking the talk, but I'm not walking the walk, I'm a hypocrite. And that brings dishonor to God. Not just our actions, but also our attitudes. You can't have one or the other. It's both. I don't know how many of you, I'm sure, it would be the vast majority, if not every one of us, could say that that we've all been hurt by the attitude of someone who is a Christian or claims to be a Christian. Just their attitude. And that's you and I as Christians that have been hurt by that. And if you're here today or watching online and you have been hurt by hypocrisy in the church, I'm sorry. Don't let the message be ruined by the messenger. We all hate hypocrisy, every one of us. You know who hates it most? Jesus. Because again, it brings dishonor to him. It brings dishonor to the, the name Christian. It brings dishonor to God. We can't let others' hypocrisy be an excuse for us, though. We need to move forward in this, and we need to, we need to again, hold up our, our piece of this, not allowing anything that is on the outside affecting us We need to move forward again with that right relationship sold out and following after him. That none of these things, and and that's where, again, it comes back to us individually, each one of us, going before God and saying, God, search me. Know my anxious thoughts. Look at my heart, Lord, and reveal those things to me that bring dishonor to you. The things that I might say, the things that I might do that that would hurt others. Now, I'm not saying that we sugarcoat the truth. No, we speak the truth. We absolutely have to. Going back to being salt and light, we have to speak the truth. That is our responsibility, but we need to also live it, but speak it in love. Speaking the truth in love. Because we're accountable before him for that. We will have to answer for that. Well, verse 25 through 29, as I mentioned, speaking of that ritual of circumcision, and it didn't, you know, again, that whole idea of being born into the Jewish family, they were obedient to the command, 
to circumcise, but again, understanding that the commandment was symbolic of what was supposed to have taken place in the heart. Was there evidence to that? And I won't read through 25 through 29 and substitute a word in there, but I'll throw it out to you. Baptism. Again, similar thing. Again, we are born again into the family of God. And baptism, if you haven't been baptized as a, as a believer, if you are born again and you have not been baptized, I encourage you to let me know about that. Let us know. And we'd, we'd love the opportunity to, to baptize you because that's a command that is given to us as Christians. But it's not just a ritual to follow. There must be a reality because that's what baptism points to. When we are baptized, we are identifying ourselves with the death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus on our behalf. That that is a reality that is in me. And we're going to look at that some more when we get into chapter 6 of Romans. But specifically, that whole thing, it's being obedient to the command. But if there's not new life in us, baptism doesn't save you. Some people believe that baptism is part of your salvation. Baptism is not part of your salvation. Baptism is just that outward declaration that says, I'm saved. And I'm saved because Jesus suffered and died and rose again for me. And I'm identifying myself with that. It's all about that piece. It is not at all, again, it, it's not the, the, the faith and that saves. No, we talk about this, it's by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, that we are saved. Baptism is just that outward sign, but there must be internal evidence. Just as he was highlighting here, that if, we are, if they aren't careful, this whole idea of, of relying on their relationship with God because they're, they're Jews, the fact that they have received the law, all of these things, and even were circumcised, none of that matters if there's no internal reality. And so I circle back to that today and we're gonna finish today and we're gonna celebrate communion, another one of those rituals that if you are not a born again believer, means absolutely nothing, absolutely nothing. As Christians, we do this because we celebrate the fact that Jesus suffered and died for us. The bread, and the, and the juice significant for his body and his blood as we remember what he did for us and we look forward to that day that we will celebrate that together in his presence. But guys, if there's no internal reality to that, it's just a ritual. It doesn't mean anything. If you're here today and you've never given your life to Jesus, you've never trusted in him and him alone for your salvation, I encourage you right now to respond to the Holy Spirit guiding and leading you. If you're online and you're watching this and you're feeling the Holy Spirit moving in you, don't put it off. Do not push it away. The Bible tells us that we can harden our hearts, that we can become callous, that we can become cold to the fact that God is trying to reach in and to, to minister to us and to, and to save us and to pull us out of this mess to save us from our sin, to save us from the wrath of God that, we are, that is due to us because of our sin. But if we harden ourselves and we, we push him away, again, none of these things are ours. But born again, child of God, all of these privileges, all of these benefits come along with it. So let's pray. Lord Jesus, oh, what a... Again, what a blessing it is to bear your name, to be called Christian. Lord, we have hope as an anchor for our soul, and, and we boast in you alone, nothing in ourselves. Lord, by ourselves, we have nothing to boast in. We are so, so blessed that you desire that we know your will. And Lord, our desire is to embrace your best for us as you reveal it to us by your spirit and, and through your word. We're amazed by the fact that you, would, that you would choose us and appoint us to be your witnesses. Lord, that, that you would desire that we would bear fruit for you and fruit that lasts to be salt and light in the world. 
to share your gospel. Lord, we thank you for revealing your truth to us and entrusting that with us. Lord, if there's anything hypocritical in us, anything that dishonors your name, please show us that. If there's anything that could cause a non-believer to turn away or cause a brother or sister to stumble, Lord, show us that and we repent. We turn from that. Lord, show us where we are relying on anything other than your power. Lord, our desire is just to completely lean on you. We thank you for your grace and your mercy and your goodness. As we, as we celebrate communion together, Lord Jesus, we remember what you did for us, how you suffered and died in our place. And if you have never received Jesus as your Lord and Savior, if you've never trusted in him and him alone for your salvation, again, I encourage you right now to simply respond to the Holy Spirit moving in your heart right now. It is not a ritual. It's about changing your relationship with your creator from one of an, of an enemy, one that is fighting against him, to a child of God. And it's all through the blood of Jesus. He suffered and died in your place. And you just simply repent. You turn from your life. You turn from your sin. You turn and you receive the free gift that he is extending you today and you make him Lord of your life. You can pray along these lines. You could say, Lord, I, I realize that I'm a sinner and I realize that I, my life is not pleasing to you. I thank you for showing me that and right now I turn to you. Forgive my sin. Fill me with your spirit so that I can please you, that I can walk in a way that honors you. I choose you today. Lord, we thank you. And we praise you. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, we're going to sing uh, one song together. I will distribute the elements. Um, the bread is in the tray that I'll pass to, I'll have with me, and then the, grab one cup um, of the juice, and we'll celebrate together.